Let's pray. God, thank you. So much good stuff going on, and I appreciate, um, I appreciate God, the way in which you provide, and the way in which you teach, um, and sometimes the way in which you correct, uh, and the way in which you lead us to become the people you desire, and if we're honest, we desire as well. And so, God, this morning as we talk about resilience and grit and how we can develop that and nurture that in our own lives, uh, God, just give us open hearts, obedient hearts. Let us not be hearers of your word only, but doers. In Jesus' name, amen. So, this week and next week, we're going to talk about grit, um, becoming a person of resilience. And I've been reading a lot about this. Um, I have a few books here that uh, Jeanette will throw up that I've been reading. Great books. Um, two of them are Christians. One of them's not. Um, but it seems to be a theme, especially coming out of the pandemic, where we experienced a, a lot of chaos and change and uncertainty. And if you were kind of on the edge of barely making it, and then you went through the pandemic, and then the fires, and then a crazy winter with trees falling down and mudslides, there's a good chance that you are feeling uncertain, out of balance, off kilter. And this is really about facing what comes our way, facing the things that we have no control of in life, and yet remaining strong, becoming people of resilience. Grit has to do with resilience. Uh, um, it has to do with tenacity, perseverance, courage. It has to do with endurance and standing firm. And I, I will tell you, one, one of the authors said this, grit is more important than talent or even IQ. But how is it developed? How do we become people of resilience, people with grit? And this won't be the first time I've talked about this subject, but um, some of you are going to be let down. You're going to be discouraged. You're going to be, oh, I wish it was something else. Uh, but here's what it is. And I think it starts here. We'll cover more next week. But it starts with becoming a person and developing a habit, a consistent pattern of finding solitude and silence. We live in a loud world. The world's getting louder. You've heard of sound decibels. Dan, what do we try to keep the decibels at in the room during worship? Especially Tim's guitar when it's just way too, 70 or 80. So uh, you guys know what a sound decibel is. For example, a fireworks show runs at about 140 decibels. I miss those. I miss fireworks shows. Uh, an airplane taking off is only 130 compared to the fireworks show, 130 decibels. Those of you who went clubbing last night, 110 decibels if you go to a club. And by the way, this is interesting. I see Pasha and Mila, they have now a one-year-old. You probably didn't go clubbing last night with a baby at home. Uh, but if you have a baby that cries a lot, 110 decibels. <laughs> Same as a nightclub. How about that? And 85, they say, tends to be a healthy threshold. Freeway traffic, this surprised me that, that it was this slow, must be where you're standing, but freeway traffic is about 70 decibels, a quiet hum of a refrigerator. Some of you might debate this one, 50 decibels. A soft whisper, 30 decibels. Breathing, 10. And zero is kind of that lowest mark that where the average person can still hear. Zero. Now, I just discovered this, but uh, there's a thing called anechoic chambers. Have you ever heard of an anechoic chamber? Here's a picture of one inside. Bill has, of course, Bill. You're the smartest guy in the room. Um, Microsoft Office, they call it Room 87, and it's in Redmond, Washington. And listen to this. It holds a negative 20.3 decibel. Negative 20.3. 20.3. And if you stay in there long enough, I'm told, you start to hear your heartbeat. The ringing in your ears, which we all have at some level, becomes deafening. And when you move, you can actually hear your bones grinding, making noise. 
And eventually, they say, you lose balance because the absolute lack of reverberation sabotages, he says, your spatial awareness. The founder goes on, or the creator of this room says, it is so quiet that spending time inside can be disorienting for many individuals as they become acutely aware of the sounds produced by their own bodies, such as their heartbeat and their movement of their lungs. Can you imagine hearing your lungs move? And he concludes with this statement, which I found really interesting. Most people find the absence of sound deafening. The absence of sound deafening. And I think we live in a day and age, and that's why some of you came up here to the mountains, because you don't want to live in Silicon Valley. You don't want to live uh, with that noise pollution. But I think that it would, would go unchallenged that um, we live maybe in the loudest point of history. But the greater concern for me this morning is not the noise pollution outwardly, but the noise pollution we all carry inwardly. And you guys know what I'm talking about. The noise of disappointment, of loss, the noise of fear, or even the noise of angry that is shouting in us. The noise of the enemies. Uh, Satan, who wants to accuse and lie to us, who's challenging our destiny and our identity. And his voice often covers and distracts us from hearing the voice of God in our lives. And then how about the noise of uncertainty? The noise of trauma, the noise of loss, the noise of the loss of a loved one, the, a pet, the loss of a dream, the loss of health, the loss of a sense of security. And you add to that the loud cacophony of social media, doom scrolling, and the modern 24-7 news cycle, which is purposely trying to anger us. <laughs> I want to look closely at the life and ministry of Elijah. If you have a Bible, turn all the way into the Old Testament, back uh, to 1 Kings chapter 19. And by the way, I know most of you believe that the Bible is important, and I want to encourage you. Let's make this summer the summer of bringing your Bible to church. I know some of you bring it digitally, and that's fine. I'm a digital guy. I don't mind that. Um, but uh, if you have a Bible, bring it. Let's make this the summer of bringing your Bible to church. Um, and so, Elijah, considered maybe one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament, who was taken up by God by a chariot of fire. He's one of two people in the Old Testament that many scholars think never physically died. God just took them to heaven, and they never had to face death. In fact, Elijah appeared along with Moses when Jesus was on a mount with Peter and James and John. And Elijah has one of the most incredible resumes of all the prophets in the Old Testament. Listen to some of his resume. He prayed that it would not rain, and it didn't for three years until he prayed again that it would rain. Um, some of us might like to have that power to control the weather, right? Uh, he was once fed by ravens, bread and fish that kept him alive while he was in the wilderness. He came across a widow, and he survived along with her, and she barely had a drop of oil and flour, and yet God sustained that and kept rejuvenating that oil and flour for three years until the drought ended, and then so did that miracle. But maybe his greatest feat, Elijah's, when he faced off with 850 false prophets. Uh, some of you know the story, but just imagine the scene. Uh, he's in, a, in, in Israel, in a time when Israel had split from Judah. There was a civil war. It split into two nations, and Israel became just like all the nations around them. King after king after king after king led them into idolatry, worship of Baal, child sacrifice, prostitution, all kinds of nutty, crazy things. And Elijah was God's voice to the people of Israel. Imagine this. He told Elijah at one point, take off all your clothes, Elijah, and walk around naked and proclaim my message. This is you, Israel. This is a warning. You better turn. You better repent. And so he gathers all the people that would able, were able to come in Israel, and he has the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Ashtoreth, uh, some other goddess, and he has a showdown with them. 
And what they do is they take a calf, they put it on the altar, and he let them go first, which is always wise. And he says, you pray to your gods and see what God does. See if he doesn't consume this sacrifice with fire. And they spent all day chanting, praying, dancing, cutting themselves physically, calling upon these false gods. And Isaiah had a sense of humor, and it was pretty sarcastic. And he kind of, hey, where's your God? Maybe he's asleep. Hey, where's your God? Maybe he's in the toilet relieving himself. And finally, they gave up at the end of the day. And so Elijah comes along and says, okay, my turn. And he, he cuts the, 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 the sacrifice, puts it on the altar, and he says, now bring three large jugs of water and pour it on the altar, on the sacrifice. Now remember, this is at the end of a drought. Water was precious. And they poured it on there, and then they poured it on again. And then the third time they poured it on, and it actually filled up a trough that was cut around the altar. And Elijah prayed, and bam, God sucked up the sacrifice, the altar, and all the water that was on it and around it like that. And the people repented. The people turned back to God and said, truly, the God of Israel is the one and only true God. Now, keep that in your mind, because that is where Isaiah's, or Elijah is at, and watch what happens next. When Ahab, he was the current king in Israel, got home, he had witnessed all this, he told Jezebel, his wife, and she was really the power behind the throne, everything that Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. 850 of them, wiped them out. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah, may the God strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. Now, how do you think Elijah should respond? Think of all the miracles. Think of his resume. God has continually and constantly showed up on his behalf. This is his response. Elijah was afraid and he fled for his life. And he went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Now, interesting, because if, if uh, Elijah was just afraid for his safety, he only would have had to travel 50 miles to get back into Judah under the protection of, I think it was King Jehoshaphat at the time. But he goes a, another 50 miles into Judah to the town of Beersheba, which is kind of the gateway to the wilderness, the desert. The same desert where the Israelites had wandered for 40 years because of their disobedience and because of their lack of faith. Isn't it interesting? Now, it then says that he went on alone. He left his servant and he went alone. And there, there's a principle here. I won't spend too much time on it because this whole message really is about how important it is to be alone, to find silence and solitude. But he went alone into the wilderness all day, traveling. And he sat down under a solitary broom tree and he prayed that he might die. <laughs> Elijah, what's going on internally? You're afraid, you're depressed, you want to die. And then he says this, I've had enough, Lord. Now you've said that to God too. Maybe you were more sophisticated or more polite, but he is just real here. I've had enough, Lord. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. And a lot of scholars think he's referring to those ancestors who wandered for 40 years because of their disobedience. Then he laid down and he slept under a broom tree. Sometimes you just need a good nap. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. Again, healthy meal. He's missing something here. Uh, maybe this is part of the issue. And he looked around and he saw there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones in a jar of water. So he ate and drank and he lay down again. Took another nap. This guy was exhausted. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, get up and eat some more. Or the journey ahead may be too much for you. So he got up and he drank. And he ate the food that was given him, and he gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai. An important, um, an important place in 
the people of Israel's history. It's also called the mountain of God. And then he came to a cave where he spent the night. See, it is time for Elijah to do business with God. He's exhausted. He's confused. He's angry. He's disappointed. He's lost perspective, and I'll show you how in a few minutes. He's out in the wilderness where he's exposed. He's vulnerable, and he tells God, kill me. What's going on here? But the Lord said to him, and this is frustrating, because when you want an answer from God, you don't want him to come back with a question. But he's always doing that to us. He comes back with a question. He comes back to Elijah. What are you doing here? Why are you in the wilderness, Elijah? And, and maybe the question that God would ask us, why are you angry? Why are you upset? Why are you worried? Where are you going? Why are you afraid? And Elijah replied, and notice, notice the spirit of what he's saying. I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty. But the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left. Talk about a pity party. And now they're trying to kill me too. And so God responded this way, go out and stand before me on the mountain. And the Lord told him, and this is the famous part of the passage, which if you've been in church for any length of time, you've probably heard a sermon on this. And the Lord told him, uh, and Eli as, Elias, as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. Think about the noise, the shaking. And it was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. He's not in the dramatics. He's not in the, the loud. He's not in the, the, the noise. And then it says, and after, um, and after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. The sound of a gentle whisper. God's finally got his attention. Now, if you're like me, we would love for God to be louder when we want something from him, when we need to hear something from him, when we need to make a decision. It would be great if God was louder. But what's interesting is how Elijah responded. He heard it, it got his attention, and he wrapped his face in a cloak, probably out of respect, and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And then God comes back with that same question. What are you doing here, Elijah? And it's not because God doesn't know the answer. Elijah doesn't know the answer. And God is trying to help him see what he needs to see. And God does the same for you and for me. Then the Lord told him, go back the way you came. Oh, wait, uh, after he asked the question again, here's Elijah's response. He repeats himself word for word. I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. And then the Lord told him, go back the way you came, travel to the wilderness of Damascus, and he tells him several things to do, but the last thing he tells him to do is huge. Listen to what he says. Anoint Elisha, son of Saphat, from the town of something, I can't pronounce it, to replace you as the prophet of God. Now, God loves Elijah. He is, he is his chosen man. But God realizes Elijah's done. He's not getting it. There's a hardness. There's a stubbornness. There's something going on in Elijah where he doesn't get it. And so he sends him away with his next assignment. Anoint your successor. And then he closes with this statement. Remember his pity party? I'm the only one. I'm the only one. Yet I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel 
who have never bowed down to Baal or kissed him. The wilderness. It represents for you and I being tired. Um, it represents exhaustion, frustration, confusion, disappointment, anger, and so much more. But it also represents the way God works in you and me as followers of Christ. It's a way for God to deal with our hearts, with our souls. Are you bored, son? Is it, is it just, okay. I owe you lunch or something for that. But why the wilderness? Why the silence? Why solitude? What does it give us? Well, I want to give you five things. If you're taking notes, five things why solitude and silence are not only important but necessary, absolute necess necess necessary for the health and the growth and the maturity of your faith in Christ. And the first one is, when you go to the wilderness, when God sends you to the wilderness, when you're invited by God, let's put it that way, He invites us sometimes to the wilderness, to the desert. We face down evil in the wilderness. Both the evil outwardly and the evil, more importantly, maybe within. Jesus, for example, is led to the wilderness where He was tempted by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. There are lies and accusations that Satan bombards you daily with. You deserve. You'll never. God can't for you. God is keeping something good from you. Follow your feelings. That sin doesn't matter. You all get those lies. You all hear those accusations from the enemy. And the ability to discern what is coming from God and what is not coming from God is so essential when we're in the wilderness. But it often takes us getting into the wilderness, quieting ourselves to where we can really hear. Kind of like that uh, chamber where you could begin to hear your heartbeat and your lungs move. There is something deep within us where God dwells where he wants us to hear, to pay attention. But we won't hear it in the noise. It requires solitude and silence. Richard Foster says this, our enemy excels in three things, noise, hurry, and crowds. Noise, hurry, and crowds. But the other challenge, maybe the greater challenge, is what about the evil within? See, it's Often when we are afraid of the quiet, some of you hate quiet, you hate silence, you hate solitude. It's loud up here, you're busy up here, you're always, things are always happening, it is so hard to slow down and be quiet and be still. But some of us, if we're honest, we hate it because the truth about ourselves is often revealed. We're forced to face those things about ourselves that are ungodly, that are ugly, that are self-centered, that are prideful. And it's never been easier than it is in the modern world to avoid dealing with your inner life. You know, it's almost as if big tech, Hollywood, the entertainment industry, the political machine, and the modern news media are actually in bed with Satan to keep us afraid, to keep us entertained, to keep us so cluttered inwardly that we miss the quiet invitations of our God, calling us to be still and to know that He is. So God's question to Elijah is an invitation. What are you doing here? It's an invitation to face the reality of our own pride, our own agenda, and it's an invitation to Elijah to face his own perception of himself, his own understanding of God's sovereign plan as if we could ever fully or even minutely understand God's sovereign plan. And Elijah comes to find that God is not in his hip pocket. The one who could say, do this, God would do it. The one who would say, heal the son, God would do it. The one who would say, stop raining, God would do it. The one who would say, call down fire and kill these prophets, God would do it. But Elijah comes to find God is no longer in my hip pocket, never really was. And that God is not in the dramatics. 
God is in the quiet, gentle whisper. And so we go to the wilderness to face the evil. But secondly, we experience God's compassion and love. We go to the wilderness, and one of the things God wants us to experience in the wilderness is his love and his compassion for us. See, after the hard truth of facing the evil within us and the evil without, we also need to experience his compassionate love. And that he loves us not as we ought to be. We all know how we ought to be. He loves us as we are. And I believe that God wants us to viscerally, emotionally, psychologically, even physically feel his love for us. It's transforming. It's not just a concept that we've heard our whole lives. Yeah, God loves us. Yeah, God loves us. And it just doesn't have any impact in our lives. And I think one of the things that can help us, and this is hard, but this is, this is a very practical exercise that every one of you could do this afternoon. You know, when we go to a memorial service, we're grieving. And it's kind of meant for that because grieving is healthy. But a memorial service also lets us celebrate that person's life. It lets us grieve their loss. And there's closure. We let go. We're still sad. We're still affected by it. But it's, it's a... It's a process set up, I think, very wisely for us to let go. But the problem is there's a lot of things that we've lost in life, but we don't hold a memorial service for us. Broken dreams, lost dreams, lost hopes, lost friendships, a loss of purpose. And that often happens during transitions in life. You're married, no kids, a loss of peace and quiet. A loss of a sense of security. And think about what it's been like to live up here in the mountains with the weather the last three years. Some of the most crazy in the last 40, 50 years. A loss of our health as we age. Things get harder and more painful. Here's a picture of a tombstone. It's a blank tombstone. But here's what I want to suggest is that you begin to identify some of those losses in your life. And maybe some of those losses go back decades. But you've never grieved it. You've never let go. You've never said goodbye. Throw a memorial service for all the things that you've lost. And then begin to rest and lean into God's love for you. He is present in our pain. He is present in our confusion. He's present in our sense of lostness. And then the third thing is, is we begin to surrender. That is to yield. And this is the hardest part of the Christian life because we like control. But we begin to surrender control. We begin to surrender our hopes and our dreams and our ambitions and our fears and our frustrations and our disappointments. We begin to surrender those to God as we live in His love. Someone says that the control, control is the enemy of spiritual formation. And spiritual form, formation is simply the formation of Christ's character in us. Controlling people are never loving people. My worst moments as a husband, as a dad, as a pastor is when I am trying to control something too much. But in the quiet... We begin to release the illusion of control, and that's exactly what it is. It is an illusion of control. Dr. Henry Cloud is one of my favorite authors to read. He's a psychologist, Christian speaker, um, and he's, I get an email from him almost daily, and one day I actually read it. I don't read it every day, but this one was really good. He's, it, it was titled Control Issues. I'm like, huh, let me read this one. Um, and he says to write on a piece of paper, create two columns. I'll put a picture up here, Jeanette, if you could put that up. Two columns. And on one side of the column, column, for example, uh, write what are the things that you have no control over that are affecting you right now. You would like to have control, but you don't. And he says, for example, a bad economy, the weather, other people, their issues, and so on. 
And then he says this, now, look at that list of all those things you have no control over and worry about it for 10 minutes. I mean, really lean into worry. Get yourself fully anxious and upset about that and then let it go because they'll still be there tomorrow. And then the other column, he says this, write down all the things you do have control over. For example, who do you reach out to for help? Who do you call? Who can you be a good friend to? What are the tasks that God has given me that I can work on? I can get exercise, which is always helpful. I can take a nap. I can eat well. I can pray. I can offer up my anxieties and my fears and my frustrations to God in prayer. See, we sometimes miss the true essence of the gospel by focusing on the things that we must do. It's important to do. But if we focus only on what we must do, that is go to church, serve, give, volunteer, read the Bible, all those are good things. But that is all stuff that is supposed to flow out of a surrendering, a yielding to God. See, the problem is we go into some of these things, serving, giving, um, uh, reading our Bible, doing because we want something from God. If we're really honest with our motives, we want God to bless us. And there's nothing wrong with wanting God to bless us, but it becomes a transactional relationship. God, I'll do for you, you do for me. But when we yield, when we surrender, we still do the same things, but we say, God, you're in control. You're sovereign. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to go where you say. I'm going to trust you. I think it might have been the very first time I came to Boulder Creek to speak. And I showed this picture of my now 20-year-old son up at Castle Rock. Do you remember that picture? I probably showed it a couple times. And to me, it's a beautiful picture of trust. So yesterday, we went back to Castle Rock, and we were going to recreate this picture. <laughs> I kid, I kid, I kid. But I was up there with my almost three-year-old grandson, and we were trying to get him to do the same thing. Take a look at his face up close. Go to the next picture. I love that picture. And we put it on our text, you know, we have a text with our whole family, all our kids, and the son who was in the first picture, again, almost 21 years old in September, he commented on Judah's picture. He said, a more realistic version of faith. <laughs> it's scary, I'm going to close my eyes, but, but I'm going to fall anyway. Number four, after all that, God has given us an assignment. And it's often coming out of the wilderness that God gives us our next assignment or renews our fervor to stay in the assignment that he's called us to. We often come out of the wilderness with a sense of direction, a sense of our calling, a sense of our purpose. This is what I was meant to do for this season in my life. And it may not be what we think it is or what we think it ought to be. And it may change from season to season depending on what God wants to do. Jesus, after facing Satan in the wilderness, was comforted by God and provided for by his heavenly Father. And he began, he left the wilderness and began his ministry. He was focused and he was ready. But you can't skip numbers one through three and just jump to four. You've got to go through the difficulty and the, the, the tenacity of, of not giving in forcing yourself to be still and to be quiet and to hear from God. It's not easy. But the part of the reward of going through that is clarity. This is what God has called me to do. And then finally, number five, we come back. We leave to be alone. We find solitude. We find silence. But we come back in power and in love. We come back with a sense of security, knowing our identity that is in Christ, understanding the lies and the accusations of Satan. And we put up our defense against those. And it's important to understand, for some of us who are introverts, who you say solitude and silence, yes please, every day. Jesus was not a monk. 
we withdraw to be filled so that we can return to be poured out. The early monks would say it this way, we withdraw from the world to return with to the world. We withdraw from people to return to people. And introverts, you introverts along with me need to be careful here because we love silence and solitude. And if we're not careful, that silence and solitude, which we consider to be a good and holy thing to do, can really become self-centered in a form of spiritualized narcissism and self-love. And those of you who are extroverts and you find silence and solitude like torture, start with five minutes. And then say, okay, God, I did it. We'll, We'll try to add to that over the days and the weeks to come. See, we need to be careful here because the Christian life is not about activity. And as a church, if we're going to be a healthy church, we cannot make church about all the things that we do. And they're good things, and I'm glad we're doing them. But they are not the essence of what it means to be a church and to follow Christ. The Christian life is about reactivity. You want to boil down the Christian life into two words? Listen and respond. Listen and respond. Respond to what it is God is calling you to do, and more importantly, who he's calling you to be. See, it's in the silence and solitude that we often understand and become aware and discover our motives. And they may not be exactly for the right reason. Becoming a person of resilience... I'm about to wrap this up. Becoming a person of resilience requires that we fight for our souls by prioritizing silence and solitude in our lives. Quiet is non-negotiable when it comes to becoming a person of resilience. See, it's not what we do in public that shapes and forms the character of Christ in us. It is what we do when no one is looking. It's what we do when we're alone. Arnold Schwarzenegger wrote this book, I think back in 1999. Probably had ghost writers. And it's all about bodybuilding. And if you wanted to be a bodybuilder, you would take this book, and if you wanted to get a hard copy, you'd pay about $110 for it. You would get this book, and you would pay attention to it. You would follow its instructions if you really wanted to be a bodybuilder. If you want to look like Jesus. And that's really the aim of the Christian life. That over time, you become more and more loving, more and more gracious, more and more secure in who you are. We must look to Jesus. Luke chapter 5 says this, Jesus has a busy day of ministry. He's healing. Crowds of people are wanting him, demanding him. They want him to touch him. They want him to heal. They want to hear his teaching. They want to get close to him. And at the end of that, Jesus heals a guy, and he tells him basically to be quiet, don't tell anyone, but he went off and told someone, and so the crowds got bigger, and this is how Jesus responded in Luke chapter 5. The report of his power spread even faster, and vast crowds came to hear him preach and to be healed of their diseases. But Jesus often withdrew, where? To the wilderness for prayer. Often. This was a regular habit for him. At least 18 times the gospel writers talk about him withdrawing to pray. Sometimes he's with people, most often he's alone. And why would Jesus need to withdraw so often and pray? He's God. And if he needed it that much, who are we to think we can get by without it? And he withdrew. And that's the key. We must withdraw from that which distracts us, that which causes fear, that which causes anxiety. And some of you, the best thing you could do is turn off the TV, get off social media for a season, do something so that you're not constantly cluttered. We must withdraw. Sometimes that's literally into the forest, into a wilderness, for a drive, whatever it is that you need to do, but getting away to be alone, where it's quiet, where you can heal, hear the still, small, quiet whispers and invitations of Jesus. As we prepare our hearts for communion, 
I love what Hebrews chapter 12 says about Jesus. See, know this, Jesus was resilient. He had grit. And he knew he needed that going to the cross. That he would never endure, he would never persevere if he didn't have the presence and the power of his heavenly Father with him. And the writer of Hebrews says this, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne. Consider him, that is Jesus, who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Jesus had grit. And know this, he endured for you. Think of all the pain, the accusations, the spitting in his face, the, the mocking, the crown of thorns, the purple robe, the, the soldiers in mock worship before him. He did that. He endured. He had resilience for you and me so that you and I could endure for him. And so as you come to the table and you grab the elements, think about the cost that he paid. Because to follow him is a cost. He tells us to take up our cross and follow him. We cannot follow him without a cross. And ask God to help you find within you the resilience, the grit, the endurance, the perseverance, the perseverance to finish the race that God has set before you. God, thank you for your word. God, as we come to the table now, we're just so grateful, so thankful that we can come and confess our sins. We can come and complain. We can come and cry out. And we can come and give thanks for all of who you are and all that you have done for us. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen.